Welcome, Angelica. Welcome, Kojo. Uh, many thanks for providing us with the movie. It's a luxury for us. And uh, I hope also you enjoy it to, to see it like stage for the third time in this small town of Bratislava, <laughs> which might be quite <laughs> occult to you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I have, I will use this, the, the, this situation for um, asking you more, uh, how can I say, explanatory and, and descriptive questions. Uh, so at the first, uh, what is the otolid? Angelica, can you start? Well, um, we called ourselves the otolith group. Uh, yes, days, yes. You know, when we kind of um, founded the otolith group um, in the early noughties, 2001, 2002. And um, it came because, as an idea, based on a commission that we were, our first, our first commission really, um, which was um, a project that involved working with the Russian Space Agency um, in Star City in Moscow and performing uh, a number of parabolic flights with the cosmonauts. Um, so we performed 26 parabolic flights and we became aware of this um, fact that when you are in zero gravity and you are floating away, um, the, way not to, the way you avoid being sick is by focusing on a horizontal line um, and keeping your eyes on that line instead of uh, allowing your eyes to go all over the place. So this sense of kind of being fixed um, stops you from uh, uh, kind of fixing your gaze, stops, you, stops the nausea. Um, the, uh, and then we, we kind of researched this a little bit and we realized that it's based on this um, idea that within the inner ear um, there are hundreds of thousands of micro crystals that sit inside the, um, inside the inner ear in a, in the, I can't remember, the cilia, yes. And we were struck by this image because also, you know, in Superman, the Fortress of Solitude. Um, we liked the idea of this crystal cave, and somehow the inner ear felt like this kind of crystal, crystalline space. But the kind of floating nature of um, these mini crystals, which were called otoliths, struck us. Um, and we liked the name otolith also, and we liked the idea of pre presenting ourselves as a group, as opposed to a single kind of, a uh, single artistic figure, you know, because we work together, but also we kind of came out of the sort of YBA, young British artists kind of um, hype, sensational hype, um, which for us, you know, was very much the kind of announcement of sort of new labor, neoliberalism, and a kind of artist to be in that sort of world. And we, we wanted to kind of defeat this by kind of calling ourselves the Ossolith Group. Also, it was, a, it was a way to stop people asking us where we were from as a kind of way to not talk about the work. Um, so, you know, when people would say, well, where are you from in this accusatory manner, you feel like saying, well, haven't you studied the history of, you know, Britain? And um, clearly, you, surely you do know that there are many Indians and many Africans in Britain. Um, so Otoliths kind of, you know, gave us a way to kind of talk, talk about um, the Otolith, Otolith, Otoliths. Um, <laughs> but also this sense of the future, gave us a kind of future sort of um, um, anterior, it gave us a futuristic kind of space to occupy because it also related to this question of balance and this question of um, ground and the kind of agravic nature of our, of our lives on Earth, which is, you know, um, a kind of geo, geo kind of, um, how do you say, a kind of, it, it's, it's like a sort of, the kind of relationship to the stone of the ear and to the agravic nature of our lives on Earth. Um, it gave us a sense of not of, only of our kind of geopolitics, but also of our kind of spatial relation that only, not only about grounding us to this earth, but also our kind of spatial um, relation to the universe. So I suppose this kind of came out of the kind of cos cosmism sort of 
when we were in um, uh, Star City, in the murals, in the ceiling, in the little museum they had there, the universe was um, unfolding um, according to kind of a series of books that led to other books that led to other books. And of course, for the cosmonauts, a lot of them had a quite spiritual relationship to the universe, which, well, or to space travel, uh, which was about sort of um, defeating the kind of mortal coil of this body and, you know, um, living and, and, you know, having an afterlife. So it, for us, the term kind of works in lots of different ways, and it still, for us, works. You know, we're talking about oscillates. <laughs> Can you tell us something more about this uh, second part of the title of, of your game, which is group? Because uh, basically, Otlid is, is not just a collective artistic body, but it also uh, goes beyond and, and it works on the edge or even in the office between the theory and practice. It works very much with, with image and what image means. It works with image both in iconoclastic but also in very like constructive way. Maybe we can even somehow, because what I have on my mind also is like Sekula's, Alan Sekula's belief in the in the in in the truth of image, in the truth of photography, not only to be like, you know, counter uh, you know, like uh, that it's not only empty signifier, because in your your case image, moving image, and also like what the artistic group does is quite something. So. Um, I, think, um, I think the notion of a group or the notion of a collective um, is, not, is not a question of mathematics or numbers. I mean, I think one person can be a group, you know. Um, I'm not sure there are individuals anyway. But I think a, a, the naming yourself a group, or naming yourself a collective, uh, signals um, a break with the standard way of a kind of normative artistic career. You know, the, the kind of way in which you're encouraged if you go to art school, it says that something is wrong with that way of conceiving yourself as a group, as, an art, as a singular artist. It says that it's not adequate, it's not sufficient, it's not enough. Um, I think the notion of group is linked to a notion of crisis, a crisis in the standard narrative of art. It signals a, a break and it signals a statement and, um, and the notion of group for us signals um, a, a profound um, dissatisfaction, discontent, uh, unease with many things, with the art world as it was in the UK at the time, with the politics of the time. And these feelings of uh, discontent and dissatisfaction have not gone away. Um, not in 2003, when the Coalition of the Willing, the so-called Coalition of the Willing, was uh, uh, preparing to launch their attack in Iraq. And not now, when Trump and his um, army are launching missiles into Syria. Um, there was many things to be discontent about. And the question is, is what to do about them from within the field that you are in, whatever that field is, whether it's art, whether it's medicine, um, it's how to announce this, this discontent. And the name group, the, the term group speaks to this. It speaks to a, a necessity to announce something. And, um, and so when people say, oh, the group is only two of us, in fact, there was a third, they miss this aspect. They, they miss the fact that the name group has nothing to do with the numbers of people in the group. It has to do with a self-authorization and a, a self-inauguration and a, a kind of a decision. This is, really the, this is really what drives this term group. Then back to your movie. 
Uh, uh, I will start with with, with you, uh, Kojo. Uh, you know, I, on like completely non-linear uh, way, I started to be busy with with uh, Eastman a few years ago, uh, and it was because I mean, I'm I was always interested in minimal music, and then through this like baroque tradition of you know Rifkin and Nyman and 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 you know then rationalism of Cage and Reich and etc. So you just discover him and then you are completely shocked like I mean why why we don't know it. And so there must be something like kind of like pan psychic with, with Julius Eastman because and now you do the movie, you know? So uh, what what was your like motivation? Like like why why Julius Eastman, you know? Um, like you I mean, I discovered Julius Eastman um, about 10 years ago. Um, yeah, about 2007. And, um, and I was shocked to hear this amazing composer. Julius Eastman was a, a gay African-American composer um, who studied composition in the early 60s, classically trained composer. Um, he played... Um, he played piano, he played organ, um, he composed, he conducted, he was a vocalist, he performed with Meredith Monk, with um, uh, Frederick Chevsky, with um, Hans-Peter Henzer, um, with many of the famous composers of the 60s and 70s and 80s, with Arthur Russell. Um, he composed about 40 works um, and uh, but he died uh, homeless and alone without any of his own recordings being uh, recorded in a proper studio. So until recently, the only music we have of Julius Eastman is uh, one uh, CD of live recordings from different concerts in the 1970s. And there's one CD called Unjust Malays. And this is what everybody is listening to. This is what I heard. Uh, this is what Boris heard, this is what Anjali heard, this is what everybody hears. It's on YouTube now, Unjust Malays, which is an anagram of Julius Eastman. So when you hear it, I mean, the music is, is ecstatic. It's different from the minimalist music that we know. It's different from Steve Reich, from Philip Glass, from Terry Riley, from Lamont Young. It's different to all of those figures. Um, it's, it's got um, many different qualities. Um, it's ecstatic, it's um, passionate, it's militant. And this has to do clearly with the fact that Julius Eastman was the one African-American composer in the militant scene, in the, in the militant, in this minimalist scene, whether we think of the downtown, minimalist scene or the, say, disco minimalism of Arthur Russell or the punk minimalism of Reese Chatham or the Ramones. In a way, there were three types of minimalism happening in America in the 70s. Uh, classical minimalism, punk minimalism, and disco minimalism. And Eastman moves between them all but doesn't belong to any of them. So he's just a unique figure. He was a genius and he was one of the greatest of them all. And so when you confront the fact that he was not able to record any of his own music in his lifetime, this brings you up against the question of new music and its own racist dimension. And the fact that Eastman was able to be a success within it, but he still faced many limits. So when people come to record his music now, when they come to perform his music, and there are many performances now, these performances are in a way um, designed to, uh, to repair the historical memory of Julius Eastman. They are a sign of the, of kind of contemporary new music sending an apology to history saying that it was wrong that Julius Eastman died without his music being recorded. 
and these new concerts, um, they've happened in recently, just this year, in, there's been one in Berlin, there's been a series in Oslo, last year there was a series in London. These are designed to bring the news of Eastman's music to contemporary generations. So these are, in a way, performances that are historical, but which have an impact, an impact that is entirely contemporary. And so um, we've observed these different concerts over the past few years, and they're getting more. Um, and so part of what we wanted to do was, in a way, um, take part in that project, but from a different perspective. Instead of commemorating the historical, um, the historical importance of Julius Eastman, we wanted to turn Julius Eastman towards the future. We wanted to turn the compositions towards the future. So in the, in the film, you hear uh, the performer, the, the, person, the first person who speaks, uh, who is a poet called Dante Michaud, and then at the end you hear the performer Elaine Michener, and they give the same speech. And this speech comes from uh, a speech that Julius Eastman gave in 16th of January 1980. Yeah, he gives this speech before a concert, a concert of his three compositions. And there he's explaining the names of the compositions, and he's also explaining his musical methodology. And if you hear, he talks about, um, he ends describing this composition, Gay Gorilla, which is not the composition that you hear. But he, the gay gorillas he's talking to are in the future. You know, he says, in hopes that I might be one if called upon to be one. And this is 1980. So here we are in 2017, 27 years after. So the idea of the film is that the pianists, they are, excuse me, they are the gay gorillas that Eastman looked forward to. So we are 37 years into his future. And the idea is that they come from the future of his music. And they come because now we, that is to say, people of color, people who are lesbian, gay, trans, we are ourselves under threat. We live in neo-authoritarian times, and the idea of this work is that Julius Eastman's music is music that trains us for the fights and the struggles that we have. The idea is that they are warriors inside of music, and that Eastman's music was music for warriors that if you listen to it, it will train you. It will give you a sense of vigilance, a sense of concentration, a sense of focus on the things that need to be done in order to defend those who you love and in order to attack those who will attack you. And so this is how we conceived the film. And this is why it's dedicated to Mark Fisher, who was a friend and an ally and it's why it's dedicated to the Movement for Black Lives, which is an, an umbrella of 50 organizations, only one of which is Black Lives Matter. Everybody knows Black Lives Matter, but there were many other organizations. And so we wanted to, in a way, direct Eastman's music towards the future, the future which is coming towards us now, and the future which we must make in order to defeat the kinds of fascism that we see all around us. Great. But in the, now to, to me, what, what is interesting, and, and again, like normally as a, as a viewer of a film, you, you can't ask, you can just imagine. Like, um, I was extremely interested in like, makeup and details, like, uh, makeup. and, and uh, <laughs> fingernails, yes. and then ergonomy and the whole ballet, but it's more ergonomy of hands playing players that, again, collectivity, empathy. So can you tell us something about that? Because this is like purely artistic construction, you know, which... The formal, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think in the way that Kojo describes about, uh, uh, in terms of Julius's kind of 
sort of way of refracting his kind of um, formal position as a composer from all these different minimalisms. You know, I think he, you know, and he queers, he queers queering, you know, quite early on in a way. And um, he queers these positions in the music. And I think for us, this was like the challenge of then how to film this, how to film, um, you know, this, this music being made. Because of course, if you're brought up like us in the era when, you know, music videos and the relationship between music video and television was really interesting, um, you know, pre-MTV even, like New Order videos and, you know, many videos like in Britain in the eight, early 80s and whatever, and some in the 70s. But, you know, one would, one kind of has, you know, you're brought up in this kind of sense that, you know, actually filming musicians can be interesting. Um, but uh, that was the challenge, let's say, how to, you know, work with this, this question of this sort of querying of his, of the music and with these um, and with this challenge of filming a piece of music, so for us the question of reflection and light refraction became quite important. So and a kind of a tool to kind of explore, you know, as a system. So we, of you know, of course, in the introduction he talks about Eastman and he he talks about four pianos and four. Pianists in this, but this piece can also be played on two pianos with four pianists. So um, it's also important to say that these four pianists um, are an ensemble that have played Eastman for a number of years. So they, we didn't just pick them, and you know they they um, they they we we originally thought let's try and find four black um, pianists, but that was quite hard in Britain. I'm sure we would have found them in the States, but because of Mark Fisher's suicide, we didn't. Um, make the film in the States, we made it in London. Um, so, yes, there was a sense also that this work is a kind of um, eulogy to, to um, people that have died in a way. I mean, Mark being the most recent one, that somehow there was something quite funereal and gothic about, you know, um, this. But um, the sense of wanting to kind of explore light ref reflection and refraction. So we worked with our camera woman um, to create um, a, light fit, a light piece that would hover above the pianos that would produce all these reflections in the black mirror of the piano surfaces. And this in turn would produce a kind of light. So it's it, it has this sort of strange sense of being in a kind of, uh, being in this kind of, in a kind of space which is kind of almost holding that minimalism, but allowing it to reflect. So then we, we, we were interested in, um, I suddenly thought, wouldn't it be a great thing to, um, you know, because I love nail salons and uh, shellac nails. I love the smell of, I, I mean, I'm, it's an ongoing study into kind of, you know, the way that uh, beauty salons operate and they're kind of quite bizarre fascistic spaces where, um, you know, you get high on, I mean, I like it, you can get high on smelling all that nail varnish, but also, but also you can see the kind of, you know, the kind of fascism, especially in places like Lebanon and the Middle East where they treat all these um, workers like dirt and these women sit there like on thrones having their nails done. But anyway, I was quite fascinated by this um, uh, the shellac colors, you know, this kind of, and the way that the, um, you could work, they, I realized that they just created a new um, chrome which um, you polish and then it's sort of silver chrome which could also work when the close-ups, because we were interested in the hands also as, you know, kind of laboring objects. Yes. Um, the kind of labor of uh, being, um, of playing this piece, we wanted to, th we wanted to work with because, um, and so the hands become more, look, become more un unified and uniform and also begin to look more like kind of these biomorphic machines, you know, just, because it's a very hard piece to play, as you might be able to appreciate. Um, and then with the um, uh, face, fa uh, with the makeup, we were interested in kind of biometric forms of makeup which defeat the algorithm and facial recognition algorithms. So um, we, we researched quite a lot of images of this kind of biometric makeup and style that 
is also quite um, kind of uh, very kind of popular, I think, sort of post the LGBT sort of generation. Um, you know, there's a lot of kind of like transgender kids kind of doing all this weird stuff. So we were sort of interested in this kind of biometric kind of stuff. But then the makeup artist came and she did it and it all looked too heavy on the face. So I thought, wouldn't it be, like, keep it quite simple, let's just follow the shape of this um, light fitting and repeat it on the faces. Um, and also in the installation of this work, which is two giant screens at an angle, if you might be able to notice, there's a lot of angles, different kind of angular um, kind of shots. Uh, we have the audience is sitting or space for them to sit, but in, in, the, in the countdown, we give, there's a break. The light fitting we've had um, actually placed on top of these, um, on the audience, so it comes on, you know, when um, people are entering to see the beginning of the work. So there was all these kind of ideas around reflection, refraction, very much related to queering, and also in relation to the kind of, uh, not, I wouldn't say post-racial, because we're not, you know, we're clearly, um, you know, I don't think that is, you know, then we'd have to get into a whole question of what post-racial is. I don't want to go into that. But it was more that this um, question of the, of the nature of this, um, this kind of term and the way this is being used, nigger, which is all automatically queered as well by Dante and by Elaine and by the musicians who three of them are white and one of them is Indian Australian. Um, identity in the construction of the people, the ensemble and the two figures is also being refracted. So for us, this was uh, all kind of, you know, a challenge and then how, and working with the kind of um, cameras and the framings to kind of produce these refractions. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, and, and now, I mean, you know, I, I announced that, that I'll be happy to deal with, like, more kind of fundamental and general questions, like, obviously, with, with Julian is a part of something what we can call Afrofuturism. And this discourse is a bit known in this territory. This is a white, white Catholic uh, environment or post-Catholic. Uh, but it is highly important uh, to establish this, these discourses here. So you as uh, one of the pioneers of this, is it a movement or is it a notion or is it a speculation? Um, I think Afrofuturism can be described in all those ways. Um, very briefly, um, Afrofuturism as a term was formulated in the early 90s to, um, to really describe um, a whole set of um, um, artistic positions that were formulated um, in many fields at the same time. Um, clearly, um, we can see this in music, um, in every type of Afro-diasporic music, from um, jazz, uh, the electronic jazz of uh, Miles Davis, uh, the cosmic jazz of Alice Coltrane, the, um, the synthetic jazz of Sun Ra, um, right through to the dance music of uh, Dizzy Rascal in the world of grime, right through to music now, whether it's Thundercat in the world of kind of prog jazz, or whether that's the label um, non-worldwide. And I think Julius Eastman, was undoubtedly an Afrofuturist. But we can also see this in the worlds of um, science fiction, in the worlds of cinema, in the worlds of theory, in the worlds of cinema and video art. So it's, it's um, crudely speaking, it is the project of um, Afro-diasporic artists to um, uh, claim the right to invent futures and to formulate futures from within their field. So it's a kind of, so it's a futurism which works in and against uh, the long history of existing futurisms, whether that's Russian futurism or Italian futurism, but really seizes the opportunity to invent futures um, in, the context of, in the context of a century in which 
Um, many Afro-diasporic cultures were um, blocked from inventing futures. So um, I would think, I think, you know, from beginnings in, let's say, uh, pretty much the UK and the US in the 1990s, Afrofuturism has really spread. And um, many of the most exciting aspects happen from within the continent itself, whether that's in um, Nairobi or Johannesburg or Cape Town or Kinshasa or Cairo or Khartoum. Um, Afrofuturism is in many of the cities across the continent. Um, and so for us, it's, a, it's an ongoing movement which uh, we affiliate ourselves with. And part of the project is to link Julius Eastman's work to this kind of ongoing movement, which I would say is now in its second wave. You know, so um, uh, in a way, it's, it's reached a new level of production. And Eastman was a pioneering figure in that context. To me, you know, I mean, what, what I have learned from Afrofuturism is that, I mean, to me, it goes much beyond Afro. Uh, basically, uh, what is the experience of Afrofuturism is something what I can call non-Western cosmology. Non-Western non cosmology. I would, um, I would say that Afrofuturism is very much rooted in the West, in a way. Uh, it doesn't only come out of the continent. I think um, it also is, is very much comes out of the African American experience, the African American experience in that um, I think the question of, um, I mean, Kojo can elaborate on this, but you know, when Fred Moten, uh, the philosopher and theorist and poet um, from the States, you know, talks about, you know, where he kind of thinks of himself, where he thinks of his ideas coming coming from, you know, I think as an as a as an Indian diasporic figure such as myself could think of the subaltern figure, right? You know, the subaltern. But I think with an Afro, Afro African American thinks of the hold of the ship, you know, whether it, it, it's a pose, it's a kind of pre-Marxist kind of position, you know, that sort of sits as the a body that has being turned into an object of labor, the, who has been reduced to this, um, has been reduced to a kind of abject figure who isn't even human anymore. So I think it's very different from a post-colonial position. Um, the the Afrofuturism Afro is literally about saying there's, you know, let us, let us invent ourselves as new humans who have been taken from one place by force and, 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 and put into another place. So I think this is a very different, and when you begin to, um, you know, African-American literature is, you know, deeply complex in relation to this question of what the other represents in, in the kind of construction of language there. And so it is, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's quite a deep um, kind of, it's, it's, a, it's quite deeply, it's quite different, I think. Kojo can elaborate on that. No, I mean, my, my point was that, you know, we, we are so-called former East, huh? and uh, uh, the aspect of, of difference or, or the other uh, is very much expressed in, like, non-linearity of, of histories, of Western history and, and the, the, East, the, the history of former East Bloc, which, uh, can be translated, and this is what I learned from Afrofuturism, uh, that there must be a certain synchronicity. It can't be linear. But when we write history from different positions, from different hierarchies and different you know, points of departure, uh, we have to learn from somehow from one, one each other. So that's why I call it like, even it is rooted in West, or as, I mean, is a West is a cradle, as, as, it is, as, as it is, as West is a cradle of so-called contemporary arts. It is still try to do the non-Western cosmology, like to move, you know, the, the point of departure of like how we understand history, how we understand ourselves out of the center to the periphery is more. So but maybe you could think of it also as coming from right inside the West, because the, the Western, Western, 
um, like you know, um, Elaine and Dante say when they recite this introduction, they, you know, the N word is the um, field. Um, I cannot even say the N word. Um, is you know the field uh, is, is is this uh, you know economic um, is this body that is producing the economy of America, so it um, comes from I think deep inside the idea of what America, for instance, considers its economy to be or itself to be. It's this history that they have, you know, uh, pretended never happened. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think there are, there are many, at this moment in time, there are many positions. There are several ways of formulating what Afrofuturism is. There are different positions depending on, you know, where you're located and depending on what you're uh, in dialogue with, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's very different... Um, situating yourself in Britain in relation to the continent and then it's very different in the US and then it's different again in the Caribbean and then it's different again from you know if it's you're situated in South Africa or in Central Africa or in West Africa or North Africa it's you know they're very different positions it's now um, um, Above all, it's a, it's a complex question. And um, in a way, the, the complexification is part of what we want. It's part of the desire to, um, to problematize many questions, to problematize um, the notion of futurity, to problematize the notion of temporality, to problematize the notion of identity, to problematize the idea of the end of the world, to problematize the idea of what comes after the end of the world. Um, it's really, I would say, um, uh, it's about um, a, a problem and a possibility for thought. And then the term which is related is Afro-pessimism. <laughs> I know you've been you've been dying to ask of this question. Yeah. I'm very much in Afro pessimism, so I'm, I'm to, to question Afro pessimism. I'm I, honestly, I'm not absolutely clear about that. It's just difficult, you know, really hard on this. <laughs> Afro pessimism is a is a um, it's a discourse which really has emerged in the last um, you know in the last 15 years or so in the American Academy. Um, it partly comes from um, African-American feminist thought, um, specifically the writings of um, Hortense Spillers. And then um, younger writers, such as uh, the writer Sadia Hartman. And then um, other writers, such as Frank B. Wilderson III. And in dialogue with them, um, writers such as uh, Fred Moten, who Anjali mentioned. Um, and I think for a long time, it was, it was a really... Um, quite a small section of people who were really returning to the writings of Franz Fanon, um, specifically the writings of um, black skin, white masks, more than the writings of uh, Wretched of the Earth. And they were really um, trying to understand um, this question of um, the afterlife of slavery. The idea that um, slavery is, in a way, no longer, but in a way there is not yet abolition. So slavery has been formally abolished, but clearly when we look at the police murders, assassinations, the continual assassinations, it's possible to say that slavery has not yet been abolished. So we're in a peculiar time in which you could say slavery is no longer, but slavery is not yet abolished. We're in the time of the no longer and the not yet. And this temporality um, means that the, the kind of affirmative reading of African-American culture, the idea that there is a kind of um, 
what Martin Luther King called an arc of history, that African-American uh, political struggle will necessarily overcome all of the uh, white supremacy that is put in front of it. That optimistic belief in the direction of history is no longer possible for many people. Uh, and the Afro-pessimists really disbelieve. They've given up on the notion of an optimistic and affirmative vision of history. They do not believe that history is tending towards uh, the overcoming of white supremacy, or as they call it, the overcoming of anti-blackness. On the contrary, they see anti-blackness as foundational to the racial capitalism of America. And they see a continuity between slavery and life after slavery. In other words, slavery has not been abolished. It has just changed its form. So they have a political analysis of the implications of this. And above all, they have an ontological analysis of this. Their argument is that they do not celebrate the cultural identity of blackness or of black people or of African-American culture. Their argument is that blackness is a condition of ontological death. That's how they describe it. Blackness is a condition of ontological death. And the implications of that are what they argue about. And this argument, which really existed amongst you know, a small number of brilliant academics, this argument has become much more important because of, of course, the police shootings and the police murders, the formation of the movement for black lives, which comes out of Black Lives Matter, and of course, the nomination of Trump and the widespread neo-authoritarian and neo-fascism of Trumpism, all of these things have taken what was a very specific and small argument about the political ontology of anti-blackness and has made this into an argument and a set of positions that many people are now interested in. And so, so that's a kind of brief summary. But I, but I think it's um, unsurprising that, uh, I mean, Afro-pessimism for me is unsurprising. I mean, it's like a position that of like, what did you say? Uh, ontological death. I mean, when James Baldwin wrote about, um, and you can see him saying this in an interview, when he says, you know, um, talks about the monstrosity um, that whiteness is, I mean, it's, it's um, so generous such, I mean, within the kind of fabric of, you know, James Baldwin's writing and Fanon's writing and so many other, inside all this is the, um, is the, I think, is the um, technologies for understanding the monstrosity of whiteness, right? But it's so crazy that these days, even when you talk about these subjects, white people sit there and say, well, this is nothing to do with me. Um, I'm not black, or this is about black people, and it's absolute rubbish. It's in, in fact the absolute op opposite. So even with this generous act of literature and writing and music and theory that has been going on now for like 200 years, whiteness still sits there and says this is nothing to do with me, which is absolutely violent, right? So of course, I think it's and, you know, I think it's interesting how this has come out of many female writers and thinkers, this kind of articulation of ontological death. It's like, okay, let's now just occupy this um, state, because that is where this militancy has to come from now. If after all this time, white people still sit there and say, this is nothing to do with us, and distance themselves from it, they're not seeing the monster that they are being asked to see because their economy, their, their structures, everything is there, you know, being produced on this abject kind of condition they have created. They have created racism, 
Not black people. Not us, you know. Uh, teraz by som otvoril uh, fórum pre otázky uh, z publika, ak teda, aké si sú? I just uh, have a short reaction of the, uh, maybe, maybe it is this violent position that you speak of that I will be in right now. But uh, from the position of whiteness, I think I think uh, I would have an apology for that because uh, um, from my position, if there is something that uh, says it has to do with the black, I I I really say that uh, yes, this is not about me. I I do not really care, but. Uh, mm, s s the same thing I, I would do if uh, if someone said this is this is about white people let's let's do stuff i don't i don't care if 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 there is a specific specification in the beginning about blackness or whiteness really maybe maybe don't you think that there um, there is also a call uh, when when you speak about afro Mm, futurism or Afro pessimism. There is there is a call for difference still. That uh, maybe not speaking of the difference is the way, or I don't know really. I don't think not speaking about difference means there is no difference. Um, I think difference is there whether we speak about it or not. I think uh, the valence the weight you give to this difference, you know, this is what's important, you know. Is this difference an incapability or a capacity? Is this difference imposed or is it asserted? Is it affirmed or is it negated? Um, I think of the fact, the fact of difference there is no doubt, but the questions begin there. So yes, your point is right, but let's move on from that and argue about what the stakes of this difference are. This is what's at stake here, because the question of difference does not have to be um, a fatal one, nor does it have to be pathological. But in America, it is. The question of difference has been pathologized. It doesn't have to be, but it has been, and there is an unbroken history of it. And this cannot be wished away. No, there is no magical thinking that can get us beyond the fact of this unbroken continuity by which the difference imposed on African Americans is the justification for their death and their exposure to death. The question is what to do about this. So it's not a question of difference. It's a question of what to do in a condition in which difference has been historically pathologized and a condition in which the history of this pathology is not historical, a condition in which the past is not past. On the contrary, the past imposes itself on us every day you will notice that the first thing Trump did was to give the police more powers, not less, more. I think there is, you know, the, uh, it's such a complex problem, you know, because at the first, uh, there is a question, who creates the normativeness, who creates norms? We are not speaking about normality. Normality is always misused by those who would like to establish new dogmas and new norms. Uh, war is also like a Freudian problem, uh, which is like a, a kindergarten of, of, of Freudianism is when someone speaks about the white supremacy, there must be some problem with whiteness. And obviously whiteness means so many things and it's so fragmented, so it doesn't exist. So this violence, like call for supremacy of, of the whiteness is a suppression of a huge, uh, you know, psychological problem. Uh, and uh, obviously there is this difference which 
in the liberal and, and uh, artistic communities is negated because we are liberals, because we, we feel that we don't feel this difference. But then this is the problem. It's a, I'm, I'm, this is also the forum where we, I think, have to speak that there are these differences. You know, so. Well, I mean, of course, differences at the heart of it and in terms of kind of a position of like thinking about how do we live together in the future um, and how do we live together with difference, of course, there's antagonism and there's conviviality. But I think people, when they ask this question of this, when they have this utopic kind of liberal kind of position of like, let's not talk about whiteness or identity, da, 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 what they don't actually think about is the question of Within their own back, within one's own background, in a place like this, for example, or in France or in Germany, or any, what in the, in the education system have you even read James Baldwin? Have you even read Fanon? Have you even studied the history of slavery? Have you even studied the history of capitalism? Have you studied the history of colonialism in India? Have you studied the history of the famine that the British created in Bengal? Have you studied the 150 million Africans that were murdered through slavery? So no, and then what do you want, what do you think happens when this has happened? What do you think happens in the consciousness of African Americans when this has happened? Are they not writers and scientists and thinkers who have thought carefully about Marxism, about communism, about capitalism, about how upon their bodies capitalism is inscribed? I mean, surely this is like a question you ask yourself, that we're not sitting here affirming identity politics. We are sitting here sharing in the spirit of what identity politics was supposed to be about, which was about people from different backgrounds, be they gay, black, lesbian, whatever, Indian, sharing their kind of um, histories. That's all it is. Whether identity politics has been hijacked by neoliberalism and now by the right wing. So, I mean, please ask yourself, think about these questions a bit deeper when, you know, um, think about if you have read these people. Because when I was at school, we read James Baldwin in Britain. And um, in America, also, kids are reading James Baldwin, despite the kind of fascist police. Kids are reading James Baldwin at school or Fanon. So, you know, think about wh why you haven't read those writers. Think about the curriculum. Okay, uh, thank you for bringing in the concept of militant during your discussion. Uh, I just want to ask you uh, about the relation between the concept of militant and desires, because it seems to me that actually to be a militant means to passionately advertise some kind of a desire, and that also links somehow to futurity and what futurities you invent. And unfortunately, it seems to me that actually now we live in a times where the majority of people are the militants of boredom and normality. So uh, can you please explain me like what are the, con the, con the relations in this triangle between desires, uh, futurity, and militants? Thank you. Um. Mark, Mark Fisher, in his last, um, his last seminar at Goldsmiths, uh, Mark teaches at Goldsmiths where I teach. Uh, in fact, we share an office. I, I, think, I, st I think of us as still sharing an office even though he's gone. And um, his last seminar was called Post-Capitalist Desire. So uh, this was his question, how to desire a life after capitalism, how to make people want that, want it like a new need, which means how to design a new life, how to desire it as a, as a want that you feel libidinally and as a as something you can touch or taste, how to have a sensorial need for life after capitalism, and um, and this was what this is what he was teaching in his final seminar, um, and um, it's a question of um, we think about it a lot in terms of design, not so much designing a product for people, but designing people for a vision, 
Um, we think of how design is not just a question of creating objects and gadgets and machines and devices, but it's a question of designing new needs, new satisfactions, and new discontents. And, um, and the question of militancy in our age, I think, is about, uh, in a way, it's about updating what Marcuse called a, a biological uh, in, in his essay on liberation, there is a section where he talks about a biological need for socialism. And in a way, what we want to do is design a new biological need for post-capitalism. Um, and for us, um, in Eastman's music, there is a disruptive force in Julius Eastman's music because, you know, you can recognize the minimalism of it. You recognize the repetitions, the changing sameness, but it's different. It's just different. It's just, it's not really like Steve Reich or Philip Glass or any other music that you've heard and loved. I love minimal music, but this is just different. And um, we think of Eastman as, you know, the, in a way, the very fact that Eastman's music did not fit into the minimalist music of the 70s and 80s and 90s suggests that it disrupted minimalism. Uh, and it's the disruption that we now hear. Now we hear how he, how he changed and challenged the minimalism. And I would say now we have an appetite for Eastman there is something about Eastman when you first hear those hammering tones, like a like a ringtone from the future. Those first, or when you hear the the kind of the repeated chorus, you know, or when you hear Zubin Kanga saying one, two, three, four. There is something mimetic about Eastman, and our whole film we see as propaganda for Eastman. That's to say. It's a 27 minute composition. By the time you finish it, it should be ringing through your head. Hopefully, the composition by Julius Eastman, Evil Nigger, is just ringing through your head. You can hear it. When you go home tonight, it will start playing itself back in your head. You will hear it. Tomorrow morning, you'll get up and fragments of it will start playing back. You'll be talking to a friend of yours and suddenly it will just your involuntary memory will just start. In other words, the music has programmed your memory. I would say it's hacked your memory. I would say this music has hacked your involuntary memory and will now start playing itself back, and you can never not forget it. If you hear Eastman's music once, that's it, it's too late. You cannot forget it. All you can do is pass it on. Say to somebody, you know what, I was at this screening last night. Some Brits, I don't know who they were, they were talking and talking, but they made this film, and there was this music, and, I, you know, have you heard it? You know, maybe you should go onto YouTube, have a listen to it, and then you'll hear it, and you'll pass it on. So this is what we mean, this, this kind of simple mimetic programming, this simple propagation of music, the music which carries with it a militancy which is imminent to the music. It's, the music itself is militant in its propagative dimension. So Eastman is our meme. It's our music. Our, and when I say our, I just mean, I mean us here, the people who gather to hear the music and who now become the vectors that will spread this music by passing it on. And this is a small-scale version of what we mean by post-capitalist desire. Post-capitalist desire means using capitalist platforms for means that are not themselves capitalist. And this is part of what we want to do with this work. But I think what within that is a kind of sense of how to retain a kind of opacity. I think opacity is... A, is um, a way to defeat forms of exposure. Um, and this has to be created, you know, if we think about Edouard Glissant, the Caribbean poet and writer, 
um, and philosopher. I mean, I'm not going to go into that now, but I'd urge you to read Edouard Glissant and look at his book, The Poetics of Relation, um, and think about the term opacity in relation to this question of creolization, which was the language of the Caribbean and which was a mixture of all kinds of different languages. And was many, there was many different kinds of Creole. Um, within this Creole, there was a kind of hidden code um, with, with, through which, like, all kinds of information were passed in order to avoid forms of capture, but also to kind of pass different kind of methodologies for survival. And I think inside of um, Glissant's thinking, which is actually another, a new project that we're going to be doing, um, is uh, there's a lot to think about in relation to how to deal with capitalism and find a kind of uh, platforms for opacity um, as a kind of counter-algorithmic process, perhaps. But this is something that Mark, we could have discussed with Mark if he'd still been around. But anyway. Otaska. Hey, uh, uh, do you hear any any of these features you mentioned, like militancy or um, the aim of getting beyond uh, the current in the current music, like club music, for example, or do you think it's vanished by now? No, I think there is. Um, I think there are many exciting. Um, kinds of militancy at work inside club music, maybe more than for several years. Um, I mentioned um, a platform called Non Worldwide, um, a producer such as Chino Amobi, I think another producer called Angelo. I'm very fond of them. Um, there's a producer in London called Klein. There's a producer called N Polenta. Um, a producer called Jesse Kanda, many of the producers around um, the Hyperdub label, many of the recent productions around Hyperdub. Um, I think there's a, um, I'm very much interested in um, artists working around um, black noise, a kind of new queer black noise. Um, um, the, some of the producers uh, around non um, producer called Serpent with Feet, the producer called Daedekin Cut. I mean, there's really a lot of producers. So I actually think it's an extremely um, uh, uh, pregnant moment uh, with many um, brilliant producers emerging. And, um, and their militancy uh, takes the form of, um, of a kind of new queer noise. Yeah, we can see this in many, many forms, whether it's More Mother from Philadelphia, whether it's uh, Eliza Crampton from the US. Um, really, there's a lot of producers. So I think uh, uh, it's exciting. Um, in a way, what's missing is the, the, the theoretical. The th I mean, in a way, there's, um, the journalism is lagging behind, but luckily, a lot of these producers are really good theorists themselves. Partly what's exciting about non-worldwide is that music is not only about music. Music is about um, theoretical and artistic positions. So they have a, they have a magazine, uh, they do discursive events. So music is, um, is, a, is a portal. Music is a doorway from which you open up. Uh, a dimension um, that people can cross through, people can pass from one one space to another, people can join in in um, not so much in chronological time but in aeonic time, a, a kind of time outside time, and under certain conditions, people can access this time, a kind of ecstatic time which does not behave according to the time of the clock or the time of the watch but it's aeonic. And, um, and this is a certain kind of militancy as well. It's not the militancy of you know, street protests and demonstrations. In a way, a lot of the best music uh, is a protest against the standard forms of protest music. In a way, it's resistant to the typical music that we imagined of 
you know, struggle and resistance. It's not angry music made by angry men. It's, uh, it's music made by queer and trans artists whose anger takes on very specific new forms. Um, and this is a lot of the music that, that I find most exciting these days. And it needs a new language. Ďakujem vám, že ste prišli.